It is Friday, September 10th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right, everyone, welcome back. Unsurprisingly, we have a lot to go over because, well, yesterday was the PS Showcase, and before that, we already had a lot of stories piling up, so we have a lot to a lot to go over here. So let's start off, as always, with our PS Plus reminder. The September games are live right now, and uh, one little key tip, if you're on PS5 right now, um, what you should do is uh, we'll claim Hitman 2 normally, like you uh, would through PS Plus, uh, nothing different there, but go to the PS Store after and claim the Hitman 3 Starter Pack, and also download the Hitman 3 Access Pack Hitman 2 Standard. Uh, this is so when you play Hitman 2, you're now entitled to all those locations in Hitman 2, but what IO Interactive did was uh, build this free pack for hit the Hitman 3 launcher, essentially, right? So you can play all these different locations, and you, you can even, you know, install the locations um, separately if you want to save space, but essentially... If you play Hitman 2 through the Hitman 3 uh, launcher, essentially, you'll be able to uh, play the game 4K, 60fps with uh, the DualSense features turned on. So that's going to be the ideal way to play what is arguably uh, the best PS Plus offering for this month. So again, if you're on PS5, do that. Now, we also got the full lineup for PS Now in September, which uh, pretty good here, actually. It's one of the better, you know, months for PS Now, and that's a, a low bar. It's not that hard to, to beat nowadays, but we knew about Final Fantasy VII, and remember, we've got a, a rolling basis of Final Fantasy titles every single month, but the full lineup for September is Killing Floor 2 and FF7, like we just said. We're just going in order here. Uh, Windbound, Pathfinder, Kingmaker, Ghost of a Tale, Moonlighter, and Tekken 7, which that one is already available in North America, but I guess it's now available in every territory, and that will expire February 28th. 2022 so you still got a lot of time for that one uh, however if you haven't started playing it just yet and you want to get to it uh, get that play time in before it fully expires now moving on to the playstation 2021 showcase it was yesterday of course and uh, i'm sure a lot of you probably saw most of what was uh, announced and things like that but if you haven't or if you want to see my reactions and impressions uh, that was a completely separate video which kind of went live later in the day um, shortly after the event uh, so that's the upload right before this one. You can go check that out. Again, my full reactions, impressions, and that is kind of a, a quick recap of all the announcements that were actually present during the showcase. But um, we do have some additional details that were cleared up and released after the event actually finished, and that's what we'll talk about here. Like, for example, Gran Turismo 7. Uh, for some reason, they didn't attach the date uh, during the trailer in the live stream, but um, we do have the release date for that, which is March 4th, 2022. So that's great. That's actually really soon. Well, soon in terms of a Gran Turismo release on a brand new uh, platform launch, which is PS5, right? And uh, kind of like we mentioned, or like I mentioned during the uh, reactions video, but, um, you know, Polyphony's been playing catch up with this franchise uh, for so long because they lost a lot of time on PS3 getting GT5 out and then having to, you know, put GT6 on PS3 again just to not lose all that progress working on Cell. And then, you know, GT Sport was like starting over again, even though it was easier to get out. And now we're finally up to where it's uh, two years, less than two years into a platform cycle and uh, we're expecting a new Gran Turismo. So if you're into that franchise, it's right around the corner actually. And it's yet another game where it's in that first quarter of 2022. Now, one of the larger reveals was the gameplay showcase for God of War Ragnarok, and it is called Ragnarok because, remember, for a while that was a, you know, an assumed colloquial title, but it is Ragnarok, and for this, I would caution to maybe skip this new story if you don't want to be, not spoiled because they talked about it, but it's just that they released a lot of these story details and uh, they showed off these characters uh, so early that I feel like a lot of people are, you know, they're saying like, why did you show all this? You know, we wanted to wait until we could play the game and see it revealed that way. But maybe they just did this because uh, there's a lot more left in the game that we're not seeing, which is probably true. Uh, but we'll, we'll go over all this extra, you know, story details and content and things. If you don't want to hear about it, uh, probably skip ahead. But to actually dive in, uh, well, first it's confirmed that Eric Williams is the director, not Corey Barlog. So the running theory for a while there was that Corey was doing this new IP, which it's not really a secret. You know, Santa Monica has been pretty open about this. They're hiring for a new AAA, you know, big budget fantasy based uh, world game of some kind. And that's probably what Corey's doing, which, you know, he he wasn't going to actually talk about this. There's going to be a time and a place for that. But uh, Eric Williams, you know, the, the torch has been passed over and Eric Williams has um, handled. He's worked on pretty much every major God of War release. He's been 
with the company for a very long time. So it's not like the game's not in good hands. But Eric did kind of dive into a few things about the game. So, for example, he says uh, pretty openly here, Ragnarok will happen and it will close up the Norse mythology, essentially, which is, um, I think, surprising to a lot of people. Uh, just that, uh, you know, we maybe thought that there was going to be one other game outside of this that was in Norse mythology, but we're being told that this is going to wrap up, you know, that whole landscape, uh, you know, gods, characters, you know, we're probably going to see a little bit of a everything in here, essentially. We also saw the design for Thor. So we can see that Thor closely resembles how he's depicted in the mythology. So a lot of people are maybe getting thrown off by this, but he is big, burly, has this you know, domineering energy, and he'll be voiced by Ryan Hurst. So that was confirmed. We actually got a lot of um, uh, reveals for some of the voice talent surrounding these characters. So I'll just showcase some of the character designs and their, their associated um, voice talent. Also, Odin will be voiced by Richard Schiff. Now, we didn't see Odin, but, you know, yeah, we're going to be seeing a lot of things going on in um, in God of War Ragnarok. So even though they, it seems like they released a lot of info, there's, of course, going to be... A, <laughs> There's a lot more going on in this game, so there's um, there's a lot they're not showing you. So I wouldn't be too concerned just yet, but it's looking, I mean, the game looks gorgeous, especially when you're looking at the, the true 4K footage, not the, the live stream that Sony did, but that's what we've got so far for God of War Ragnarok. As for Forspoken, we have a pretty thorough lineup here of all the talents around in this project and, uh, well, across multiple disciplines. So for example, the writing staff, we already knew that Gary Widow was involved, but now we have uh, Amy Henning, Allison Reimer, and Todd Stashwick. So pretty impressive there. And as for the voice actors, we've got Jonathan Cake playing as those sentient cuffs that we saw in the trailer. And then Janina Gavankar plays Tanta Sila. And the way this character is described, it sounds like she's playing an antagonist, so not really sure what she's playing exactly or who she's playing. Um, for the composers, though, you have Bear McReary of recent God of War 2018 fame, alongside Gary Scheiman, who worked on Bioshock. So there is a lot of very impressive talent attached to Forspoken, which is encouraging. Uh, it does seem like with this recent trailer, it was great with gameplay, combat, showing off more of the environment, you know, really showing off the substance of the game. When you look at the, the dialogue and the quick story synopsis that we got, I'm seeing some people maybe feeling underwhelmed. And it's important to remember that you can't really, you know, a game might not be able to pull you that easily in a two, three minute trailer. So you can't get a full idea of what the game is really going for there. But when it comes to like, you know, what we've seen so far and again, the uh, incredible talent attached to this project, at the very least, I'd say it's um, worth being cautiously optimistic for. And so that's kind of how I'm approaching uh, Forspoken right now. Now, as for this Uncharted, the Legacy of Thieves collection for PS5 and PC, the PlayStation blog later clarified that the PS5 version will be first early 2022 and the PC version shortly after. So it's sounding like it's just a few months off based off the fact that, uh, well, Naughty Dog is doing the PS5 version in-house, whereas the PC version is being handled by Iron Galaxy. So they're not going to be able to perfectly time that up. So presumably the PC version is probably one or two months after the fact, assuming everything goes according to plan. And we have no word on any sort of expected uh, free game upgrades or save file imports or the um, expected enhancements that we could see on PS5. Nothing like that so far, although you would have to expect that we're looking at, uh, you know, 4K, 60, um, DualSense features, things like that. So we'll probably get um, more clarified info uh, by the end of the year or sometime early next year. Now, as for Spider-Man 2, we don't, uh, we don't really have a whole lot here, unsurprisingly, but we did find out about the creative director, which is Brian Intihar. The uh, game director is Ryan Smith, and for Venom, who's, uh, who's voicing Venom, that is Tony Todd. So pretty exciting stuff, and also not really surprising, but uh, Yuri Lowenthal and Najee Jeter will reprise the roles as Peter and Miles. So it's sounding great, uh, 2023, and uh, in all likelihood that'll be first because Marvel's Wolverine will probably be later. So the few things that we did learn about Wolverine is that uh, well, this is uh, being staffed by the folks that took care of Miles Morales. So that would have been Brian Horton. He's now the creative director on Wolverine. And uh, Cameron Christian is the game director. And they do admit this is early in development. So if we're looking at Spider-Man in 2023, then yeah, this is probably going to be further away, which is, you know, kind of, eh, it's not great to hear about a game this soon. And it's not to say that we can't, I mean, they're two teams, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't ship, you know, two big games within the same year. In fact, that's that seems like an insomniac thing to do nowadays. 
uh, but they do say that it's in early development, so probably this one's uh, really far out. They do also say it will lean into an emotional narrative with cutting edge gameplay, pun intended, over on the PS blog. This is exciting though. I mean, Wolverine, it's just knowing how they handled Spider-Man, you can't not be excited for what uh, Wolverine might end up looking like. And you have to figure that Wolverine is probably going to be more of a tighter, uh, condensed, uh, linear narrative game, right? So not like open world or being able to, you know, go wherever you want and things like that, right? It's just not really conducive to Wolverine as a character, or at least, you know, what he's able to, <laughs> what he's able to realistically do. Uh, but that's just my theory. But, you know, we probably won't have much news for Wolverine anytime soon after this, after this event. Now moving on to our stories that happened before the PS Showcase, and this one is quite big, uh, but PlayStation has reversed their decision on the Horizon Forbidden West upgrade fiasco, which I'm still really, <laughs> I'm surprised by this still, because, well, last week I was pretty pessimistic, right? You know, going, why are they doing this? How is it not, how are they not at least charging for it? Oh, they're going to do this for GT7 and uh, God of War, but no, they did what looks like mostly a complete U-turn, so... Over on the PS blog, the Sony Interactive president and CEO, Jim Ryan, uh, did say, and I quote, Last year, we made a commitment to deliver free upgrades for our cross-gen launch titles, which included Horizon Forbidden West. While the pandemic's profound impact pushed Forbidden West out of the launch window we initially envisioned, we will stand by our offer. Players who purchase Horizon Forbidden West on PlayStation 4 will be able to upgrade to the PlayStation 5 version for free. I also want to confirm today that moving forward, PlayStation first party exclusive cross-gen titles newly releasing on PS4 and PS5, both digital and physical, will offer a $10 USD digital upgrade option from PS4 to PS5. This will apply to the next God of War and Gran Turismo 7 and any other exclusive cross-gen PS4 and PS5 title published by Sony Interactive Entertainment. So that last bit there tells me that they very much were not planning on doing that, right? Not even offering a paid option, right? But now they're outlining that yes, Horizon will be free, but the next, you know, any other games, including these two big titles that are relatively soon, those will be a $10 fee. So I think this demonstrates uh, two main points here. The first one being this company is willing to adapt and change and admit when they're wrong and change course like we saw with the PS Store closures or um, admitting fault for the PS5 pre-order debacle, right? PlayStation is not perfect. They're far from it. And so yeah, they're, they're out of touch at times with their core audience, but that goes in direct conflict with kind of the point that I brought up last week. They're in their own lane for many of these things, right? And so I know it's natural for a lot of people to draw these comparables with their closest competitor. Hey, look at what Microsoft is doing with their services, acquisitions, um, even something as simple as social media output and how they talk you know, to their customer base. You know, why isn't PlayStation doing X, Y, and Z for all those things, right? Why isn't there an answer for each one of those individually? We see with this $10 fee moving forward, like, yeah, Horizon will be, that'll be free, but they're saying, yeah, you're still paying 10 bucks for those upgrades. They are not as reactionary. There are certain things where they still feel they don't have to, they don't have to have an answer for what Microsoft is doing. And when you look at the, the console sold and the games sold, I mean, you can't really blame them necessarily not to defend that. I mean, in an ideal world, everything would be free and affordable. And that's just the point, right? Uh, moving forward, I hope they are willing to change when we have another situation like this come up. And I'm sure we'll probably run into another one. But for the time being, this was the right call. I also would assume that the PS5 pricing will be adjusted accordingly because you can't have 60 and 70 because most people should buy the PS4 version, get the free upgrade unless you're like me and you want to you wanna collect PS5 box art, then you'll, you'll willingly buy the PS5 version. If they don't adjust the price though, I mean, yeah, I would recommend buying the PS4 version. So either way, um, this was definitely the right way to go and it was really good of Sony to recognize that they messed this one up big time. Moving on to our next news story, Sony Interactive Entertainment has announced another studio acquisition. This time it's developer Fire Sprite based in the UK. And this one has not really generated a whole lot of buzz. And I can see why, because Fire Sprite isn't really a uh, well-known, high-profile developer. Uh, but this uh, really fits the criteria for Sony. So while I didn't expect this, it very much uh, vibes with what we've kind of been saying over and over, which people still aren't really getting when they say, you know, Sony should acquire developer, uh, you know, big well-known publisher or developer X, Y, and Z, right? That's not really how they approach this. So Fire Sprite, um, which they're a relatively new company. They were founded in 2011 or 2012. Uh, basically, we can go over their entire portfolio. It's very 
uh, short here, but the Playroom, they did contract work on that. Run, Sackboy Run, which was for PS Vita, iOS, Android. Air Force, Special Ops, that was a PSVR experience. And then the Persistence VR, this was their own original project, which Sony funded. And then that game also went uh, 2D, available on PS4, X1, and, and they've done a bunch of other contract work. Uh, probably in between that, some smaller stuff like animation and whatnot that they don't have too many credits on. Uh, but in March, they did announce a partnership with Cloud Imperium Games to work on a multiplayer mode for Star Citizen. So not sure what's going to happen there, if they're going to finish that contract or if that's, you know, canceled or whatever. But just for a little extra background here, um, Fire Sprite was founded by former Studio Liverpool staff. So it's kind of like, it's kind of full circle, really, when you think about it. Although maybe in kind of a weird way, right? Because Sony closed Studio Liverpool. They went and opened up Fire Sprite and now... <laughs> And they just joined the PlayStation family again. Hopefully they'll stick around this time. Um, but the PlayStation Studios head, Herman Hulst, had this to say when speaking with GameIndustry.biz, where he says, and I quote, They're very experimental in their approach to game development. I think the combination of that legacy and that entrepreneurial spirit, that's a great foundation for us to collaborate on the few great exclusive game projects that we're working on together. It is just the right time for them to join us and double down on the projects that we're doing with them. To solidify the relationship and to give them a proper seat at the table when we have formal knowledge exchange with other studios. They already have some strong ties with certain first party studios, but I want to be clear that we want them to lead the development of several game projects rather than helping other teams out, even though they have been collaborating with us before. Now that last part is uh, definitely the big point because Herman is outlining this is going to be a forward-facing developer where they make their own games. This is not like Nixa Software or the Malaysia team. You know, it's not something like that. They're going to be making their own titles. And when you look at that uh, portfolio where it's largely contract work, they did get to the persistence eventually. That's their own game. And we do have one ongoing rumor for Fire Sprite where they had some job listings that it seemed like, uh, you know, they were looking for uh, VR development on console, which is only PlayStation, and it was for a multi-million selling original IP on console that's well recognized. And so the running theory there is that possibly we're looking at a Horizon VR spinoff. So potentially that could be something, right? But actually they have more job listings with two other titles that uh, they didn't want to comment on right now, but one is allegedly a game-changing huge multiplayer shooter and another an ambitious dark narrative blockbuster adventure. Now that's a lot of projects going on, but it's worth noting that uh, Fire Sprite is at like 250 something employees, like 250, which is a lot. That is enough to handle various things at the same time. So that's not to say that all these things uh, were a good vertical slice and Sony was like, oh yeah, we want you on board. I mean, the thing is, uh, Fire Sprite, I think is a, a great example of a long-standing partner that was you know on the the cheap quote unquote right not to like devalue the team these are former sony liverpool staff they know what they're doing just that they don't have that they don't have that history of a well-known developer that's uh you know of a high caliber and has released a lot of their own you know original software and they've done really well right the the valuation for this company probably wasn't that high right and so it, it seems like this was a a reasonable buy for sony and if this is something where they're working on, you know, another multiplayer project and then something where it's got this dark narrative focus, this also is in line with Sony um, diversifying their own portfolio because, again, they kind of want to, they don't want to necessarily be strictly known for these big budget single player experiences where they fit that, you know, open world or light RPG elements, right? Now, they're great games, they're fantastic, but there is fatigue setting in for some people and they want, you know, they want something in the multiplayer space. They want to start exploring other genres. And so that's uh, probably what Fire Sprite is doing, right? A reasonable purchase where they could probably uh, fire on all these cylinders. And I, I'm excited to see what comes out of them because now that they're under the PS Studios umbrella, they have that resource access. They can talk more directly with these developers and have candid conversations. This is the benefit to being a part of PlayStation Studios. So... It may not seem very exciting right now, but this is uh, another developer that we now will watch very closely, and I can't wait to see what their uh, what this next project out of them or projects looks like. Um, it's also actually worth pointing before we move on. Um, Hulst did say that they're not strictly going to be for VR development, so 
that was also like my immediate reaction was like, oh, we have that Horizon rumor, so this is uh, for the next gen PSVR, right? What Fire Sprite is really good at is uh, tinkering, right? So they've done things with the camera for you know the playroom or also the dual sense features uh, they've done vr so they like experimenting with all these different things so it's just, it just seems like again they're firing on all these cylinders and that's what fire sprite is um representing here for this acquisition for our next news story the former chairman of playstation worldwide studio sean layden was recently speaking with jason schreier over on bloomberg and discussed a number of things but most notably they talked about his departure and why he left and that's one thing where a lot of us have been curious as to why he left because the way it was announced was a little strange you know it was just a, a random tweet sent out like around 8 p.m or something like that it was weird uh, not a formal press release of course so People have been wondering, you know, what went down. And Sean Layden, uh, when asked about this, uh, pretty much said that it's a, uh, you know, a young person's job nowadays. And it was um, something where he wanted to leave out on top or, or really put a pin in his career on the at the height of the PS4's popularity with recent releases like Horizon and God of War. Uh, he actually says, and I quote, that seemed like a good time to step off on top and allow another generation to take the PlayStation 5 to market. Uh, now, when asked about a potential, you know, power struggle between Jim Ryan, which has been kind of a looming rumor, he says, uh, he doesn't answer it directly, but he says, I think I took my time at the moment I saw best to take it and I couldn't be happier. So as expected, he's not necessarily going to admit anything if there is anything to admit. So if there was, say, real animosity towards Jim Ryan or anybody else at the company, he's not going to... He's not going to say that, um, but people are still going to draw their own conclusions about what happened because they either dislike Jim Ryan or they can see in all fairness that Sean Layden, when he's on Twitter, he likes all these tweets where people are asking him to come back or sometimes the tweets have anti, you know, Jim Ryan rhetoric in there. And so, I mean, it's, it's very possible, but the one thing we can say for certain is that there's a level of truth to what he's saying, right? He's been with the company for 20 something years. He was a part of six platform launches. He had a high level position at the company, which for all these, you know, high level corporate jobs, it's a lot of stress. It's uh, takes a lot of energy. It's time consuming. These guys want to slow down sometimes, and that's totally fine, especially when it's very indicative of what they do after they leave. So it's not like he left for another developer or publisher or platform holder and got a similar position. He joined an advisory board for the Streamline Media Group for something that he's passionate about. And that's what a lot of these people do when they have a 25, 30 something you know, career history with one company. They um, like to slow down. They join, a lot of them join advisory boards <laughs> or they, they get into consulting or they do something in a completely unrelated separate field because they have their own personal lives and passions and they want to slow down. So whether there was any sort of weird, you know, happenings going on within PlayStation headquarters, which that's, that could be very possible as well. People are people, uh, you know, conflict is very easy to, to happen nowadays, especially in a corporate structure. But the point is whether that happened or not, um, what he's doing now is also true, right? This is probably much more beneficial to him and he's probably much happier for it. Moving on to our next story, we have a not so good update when it comes to PS5 uh, stock or PS5 supply, or really Xbox Series S and X supply or Nintendo Switch supply, GPUs, cars, computer, anything really. It's not looking all too good. Uh, so recently this was coming from the director of semiconductors at Toshiba, Takeshi Kamabuchi, where he says, and I quote, uh, game console makers are among the customers making the strongest demands and I'm sincerely sorry for the frustration as none of them have a 100% satisfaction. And he goes on to elaborate that in some cases we may not find, or we may have some customers not being fully served until 2023, but he expects that for a lot of this, uh, customers won't be fully served until September next year, essentially. So one year from now, but there's a very real possibility that could slip into 2023, which is, it's kind of nutty to think about, right? Because, I mean, gosh, we were even thinking uh, right before PS5 came out, like, oh, you know, the stock's going to be tough at launch. It always is. But uh, it's all about that first quarter, second quarter of next year and what will demand look like? Well, clearly demand's through the roof, right? Um, especially because... Sony is still um, able to allocate enough of these things more than what we saw for PlayStation 4. So the rate of sale is quite high. We know that people want these things, um, but this just, it stretches to all these different sectors, right? Not just game consoles. It's just still insane to think that the infrastructure we had in place was really only coming from, you know, a handful of factories for the entire global production of semiconductors. And, you know, that's why right now there's kind of this 
um, everybody's freaking out trying to build these new production lines and facilities to accommodate for what was like a massive oversight on a on a global scale um, but I can't remember any other time where we had a console that was sold out this long or this hard to find for this long and how long it might end up going until right um, you might not be able to comfortably walk into a store and buy a PS5 until 2023 and that's wild to think about moving on to our next news story let's go over some rumors uh, we've got one yet again from xbox era co-founder special nick where over on twitter prior to the ps showcase he had discussed uh, or he'd mentioned in one single tweet about how take it with a grain of salt but apparently infamous might make some sort of return at the sony showcase and he couldn't uh, get this confirmed keep in mind at this point we've had a lot of rumors uh, or a lot of playstation related rumors from Special Nick. I'm keeping track of a lot of this stuff just so we can have a good history to, to comb through to say, you know, oh, they're reliable, super reliable, or they're getting more things wrong over and over and over again, things like that, right? But uh, even though he kind of covers himself here saying, oh, I couldn't really get it confirmed, it's just putting a lot of that stuff out there and a lot of sites end up picking this up and then it's like, okay, well, everybody's talking about it. What am I going to do? Ignore it or, you know, bring it up here and say, eh, maybe don't believe it or the possibility of it returning would be great. And I agree, I would love another Infamous. Um, of course, the PS Showcase came and went and there was no Infamous and this would be a, that would be a Sucker Punch uh, title unless Sony contracted it out to somebody else. We know that Sucker Punch is knee deep and Ghost of Tsushima stuff right now. And so I don't necessarily, like I don't know if they're doing another, if they have another team uh, working on something like this, it's not entirely impossible. But now we've got all these rumors uh, circulating about these uh, classic PlayStation IP like Infamous uh, Wipeout, which actually uh, we didn't even mention it during the Fire Sprite story, but how Wipeout um, is making a return and that was uh, maybe theorized like, oh, Lucid Games could take that. Well, now if Fire Sprite's into the mix, you know, maybe do they, do, does that staff want to revisit that IP? Uh, also, one other one uh, that I'm missing here, oh, Sly Cooper, right? Um, so we've got all these games floating around. Who's going to do them? Um, who has time to do them? Who wants to do them? So we're going to keep watching all these things and see what ends up uh, you know, being true or not. And then we'll understand further on when to take these uh, rumors more seriously. Next up for this rumor, it is a continuation of one that sprang up uh, fairly recently, like three or four weeks ago. The Twisted Metal comeback rumor where it came from Tom Henderson on Twitter, well-known leaker in the Call of Duty and Battlefield franchises. And after that, we had Andy Robinson of Video Games Chronicle. Uh, send out a tweet saying that he had heard something similar and then David Jaffe the co-creator of the Twisted Metal franchise He said he didn't hear anything uh, Well now we have Games Beat reporter Jeff Grubb recently mentioning on his Giant Bomb show that he has heard it is on the way uh, But probably it's further out than we're than we're thinking that it's an early development and uh, Possibly Sony's trying to coincide it with the release of the TV series, which that's confirmed. We know it's coming There's a Twisted Metal TV uh, series spinoff, which that's uh, probably further out as well. And so if they're trying to coincide it, that would uh, make sense. And uh, Jeff also tries to elaborate further by saying that Sony's trying to, you know, maybe they're looking at um, chasing the prestige of, you know, aligning themselves with these big Hollywood releases that, um, and keep in mind, it would be a, you would assume a quality Hollywood release, right? And he kind of uh, compares this to uh, The Witcher 3 or The Witcher TV show, which there's a, we have a few good examples of video game adaptations uh, translating well to TV and film. Not many, but when it works, um, you know, it pays off quite well. And so in theory, that's maybe what Sony's trying to do. And amongst all of this, uh, when this was reposted and reported on Video Games Chronicle, once again, Andy Robinson uh, doubled down on this where he says, yes, this corroborates with our, uh, our own sources that Twisted Metal is indeed coming back in some way, shape, or form. So we've got three different sources now, all of which have a fairly reputable track record that you know you can look back and reference. They're pretty good within their respective fields. So that's um, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And that's uh, when it comes to rumors, right? We have a handful of them where they're almost always wrong or ridiculous. They're from you know either Pastebin, 4chan, Reset Era, or whatever. And a lot of it's ridiculous. There's so much nonsense out there. But you can kind of you know this is the uh, the stage in which you see projects play out, and these are the ones that usually do end up being true um, but because it's so far away there is that chance or possibility that this may not come to fruition uh, but one thing's clear something's going on behind the scenes and it would fit the bill for what Sony's trying to do right expanding that portfolio outside of the games that they're most well known for 
that doesn't mean less of those games, but rather uh, all the big budget single player stuff. Finally, maybe some high caliber multiplayer games, uh, weird attempts like, you know, Returnal, um, Destruction All-Stars, doubling down on Team Asobi, the recent Fire Sprite purchase. Uh, seeing Twisted Metal come back would absolutely fit that criteria for a different kind of game in today's landscape, and I am 100% for that. Now, with all that said, it is time to get to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter, and if you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry, and I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games. Those are all the stories that I want to talk about with you all from this past week. Our Tuesday video was a recent game pickups uh, collection video, so picked up a lot of, uh, well, a few games, but also some obscure and rare PlayStation accessories. Go check it out. And then, like we mentioned earlier, the uh, PlayStation Showcase was yesterday. So if you want to see my uh, full reactions and impressions right as the event pretty much was happening and after it ended, go check that out. And then coming up, we, we've got more gaming news, obviously, next Friday, but also that Tuesday video, as we often like to do here. That's it. Uh, that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me, and I will see you all next Friday.